Hey, uh, everybody. So, I was having a disagreement with Filthy. Well, more specifically, I have a disagreement with him over um, Strauss Howe generational theory. And I say I have a disagreement with him. I mean, I really haven't made that big of a deal about it. In fact, I only mentioned it the first time like a few days ago. But, you know, since most other debates on YouTube are or just turn into complete shitstorms. I figured uh, it would be interesting to have a debate like this because the people in our audience, it's two, we're both people who, according to both of our audiences, are not complete Spurgs. <laughs> Which is ironic because I actually am Spurg. <laughs> How does that work? I don't know, but. Uh, I had uh, three points of contention, mainly, and from least important to most important. Uh, anything that you want to say? or? Yeah, I think I should at least clarify one thing that, I mean, it goes without saying that this is not the end-all, be-all uh, understanding of how history works. There's a lot more nuance to it, and obviously it's a lot more mechanical. Like, you really, like, open it up. And you're gonna find that things are just a lot more complex than this. Than just this happening because this happened because it's a third turning, or this happened because this person was born in this generation. Obviously, each turning is gonna have different individuals, actors, results. All that's arguing is that these things conform to certain very broad patterns, and that these patterns are fairly consistent throughout history. Furthermore, like this is. I don't th even think it's fact. However, I just think that it's a theory with a lot of merit, just based on historical, uh, with a lot of ex explanatory power towards uh, basically the previous 500 plus years of history. All right. Well, that sort of goes into my first problem with it, and that's that it presents itself as a scientific theory, yet there are a lot of points where it predicts itself, it cherry picks pieces of information, and it seems really more subject to opinion, and I'll give you a few good examples. Uh, the very first cycle documented by William Strauss and Neil Howe uh, in their theory was the Re Reformation Seculum, which was only two generations, a hero and an archetype. The Arthurian generation from 1433 to 1460, and the humanist generation from 1461 to 1482. Aren't there supposed to be four turnings, yet here there's only two, and it lasts longer than the last few turnings have. Uh, this turning in effect since 1943 and the previous turning the millennial seculum only lasting 74 years in total well the current of uh... i'm sorry you were finished oh that, that was my point but i guess i could also add that the great power seculum three seculums again the court ago according to the theory uh they're they're straight up they skip the third one. They just don't note a third generation. There's the transcendental generation, there's the gilded generation. They skip one and go straight to the progressive generation. So that that's my point, is that it's proposed as if it's a scientific theory, walks all over itself, and doesn't... It, it's very inconsistent with its message. Alright, so my first response is that, uh, well, that's a a lot of examples you provided, I'll try to explain them as best as I can. So with the first seculum, you referred to, I have to have this information in front of me. Give me a minute here. So with yeah, I had, to, I, I had to take notes before uh, saying all this. Right, yeah. So with regards to the uh, late medieval seculum, the Reformation seculum, I believe you called it, from uh, 1435 to 1497. Right. I believe the difficulty in there is not really from uh, cherry-picked information, but more so much as 
I guess you could say a lack of information. What I mean by uh, cherry picking was not that they're cherry picking data in this instance, it's that the theory proposes that they're supposed to be four, four generations in each cycle, yet they modified it here for no given reason to just be two. And the only two generations they gave were a heroic and an archetype, so they skipped the first, the first and the second. I think the simple answer is that there's not enough information on the respective uh, prophet or nomad generations, so I think that's why it's skipped. I don't think it, I don't think they've completely ignored it so much as there's not enough information about what happened before in detail to possibly correlate. But, so it doesn't really start, it doesn't really stop at the uh, first and second turning of that area like that, that. That happened. There's just not enough information to go on. I don't know this for sure, so to be fair, I'm probably I'm. You could probably call me out for uh, special pleading, but that's just my understanding. Problem with that though is that the Great Power Seculum from 1792 to 1859, they skip a generation, and it's the hero, the third one. So they know about they know enough about the first, second, and fourth, but they skip the third that's a thing that's a very uh that's a civil war seculum which is extremely interesting in one very specific way i mean the explanation that strauss and howe give is that in the civil in the civil war seculum you have the basically the worst traits of some of the archetypes which is to say that the uh the adult generations and like the worst aspects about them, the progressives and the gilded, that they just really came to their own. And this basically this greatly accelerated the progress of the turnings. And you had the result of when the uh, the Civil War uh, fourth turning would take place over like five years. It would start from uh, the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln all the way to Lincoln's assassination. And this is also why like they explain that the Civil War was just so brutal because you have so much of what is supposed to take place over 20 years compressed into a five year time span. And when you have that compressed into five years, you don't really have a generational archetype that rises into prominence since enough people couldn't possibly be born in five years. So that's why the there's no hero generation or no civic generation in the Civil War seculum. Well, there is an archetype generation, and but but also the gilded generations, eighteen twenty two to eighteen forty two, and the progressives, eighteen forty three to eighteen fifty nine. So, th th they were raised and grew up before the Civil War. Hmm. That um, you, you're saying that was William Strauss and Neil Howe's explanation. So it it seems if that's the case, they. Uh, they just may not have a very solid grasp on history. That's hard not to say. To, what, not what not to be in, not to be insulting. I mean, I'm not trying to insult them. It's just that that's a very a very ahistorical claim, and response to just straight up skipping a generation. Well, if, if that was the case, why wouldn't they just make one generation? Why would they separate the gilded from the progressives, even if that was the case? I don't know if I could uh, give an answer without repeating myself. Uh, basically, my my first point of disagreement with the theory. Um, anything else to say? Or well, you did you did uh, point out the millennial seculum, which is the one we're currently going through. My my second point addressed this before I got into my first one. It's that these um, seculums they seem to be very subjective finds a seculum is incredibly subjective. A uh, good example of which would be the uh, silent generation as an archetype, which is the generation that fought in World War II, 1925 to 1932. Uh, oh, just a quick uh, clarification, the silent generation, while there might have been some individuals who lied about their age, the bulk of the fighters would have been the GI generation or greatest generation, uh, the hero, arch or the hero uh, generation from Born in 1901 and 1924. That that wasn't my point, but that's that's an interesting thing to note as well. My my point though was that 
if you're living in the United States or you that there can be a greater good which there can't be literally there can't be because in order to uh, initiate force in a way that benefits somebody you have to disadvantage somebody else in the process but mm -hmm. I, I digress hundreds tens hundreds of millions of people died in that generation over basically power and the, all the US did was response and then they installed the UN and Europe and the allies in Europe installed the EU and let's not forget what was going on in the Soviet Union at the time which the the Second World War did absolutely nothing to stop in fact it sort of exacerbated it it not only ex exacerbated it made it worse well that was that was my point it but just exacerbated the problems because they had to use so much of their already scarce resources during the war my point was is that be seen as an archetype generation from a very specific point of view if you come from a very specific background and you have a very specific political point of view because, but objectively that wasn't type generation because what came out of that was not good you had all these people dying and all of these incredibly tyrannical political organizations being formed out of it and in response you got a generation uh, you, you got the baby boomers I don't think I need to go into detail how bad they are oh god you, you have you seen my videos I do nothing except crap all over them <laughs> I regret nothing honestly the Vietnam War should have gone on for longer I support a new Vietnam War uh, come 2050 just to cull the next baby boomers. Okay, uh, do you have any like response to that? Yeah, so your point was uh, you don't like the idea that the GI generation would have been labeled as a hero generation? That, that, that wasn't my point. My point is that the classifications for um, these generations and what how they conform to the theory seems to be incredibly subjective. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm I, I'm I'm not sure how. I mean, I, how I, I just gave an example. Objectively, what happened during the GI generation is hundreds of millions of people died, and these terrible political organizations were installed. And look at that from a very slanted political perspective. Then the United States expanded its influence around the world and he did access powers oh there's no deny I th although there's a, a lot of uh, popular history that would paint the conclusion of the World War II or the great power seculum as a great victory I've come to the conclusion that the whole struggle was just I international authoritarianism versus national authoritarianism and I, I said as much in my last video in my last video in the uh, what that's what I'm saying. It was just a tragedy all around. There wasn't really a winner objectively. Yeah. So I don't think we can really make a, a moral judgment. I think I don't think we should uh, take the information at least as a moral judgment in regards to their conclusions. Like what conclusions we draw from it. Obviously the winners are going to be the ones who write the history books. So I think this is largely why people consider the World War II to be a great victory for freedom, even though probably would have been better off if the Axis won. Then you... but then you... wait, what? <laughs> I don't know, I'm just uh, thinking... I'm that's, just, that, that's terrible, I know. That's but too edgy. That's too, that's too edgy. But uh, hear me out, I mean, the, ac the Axis powers, they were largely nationalist and they were largely kept to themselves. They didn't really have much uh, international. I know, as a matter of fact, Hitler wouldn't have because his view of socialism was that every country in the world had to be socialist in order for a uh, uh, socialist society to work. So he would have taken over Europe, then he probably would have gone to to Africa with Japan, tried to take over Asia, which I seriously doubt that would have been successful because of China, but. Uh, if Hitler would have got his way, the whole world would have been national socialist. 
Yeah, you're probably right. Uh, yeah, there's there's no winning there's no winning side here. Um, I mean, it does can... seem to be just it it does seem to just be the history the winners are writing the history books because then you've got um, parliamentary generation in fifteen from fifteen sixty six to fifteen eighty seven being uh, described as an archetype generation. The Arthurian generation, which I mentioned earlier, 1433 to 1460, as a heroic generation. Uh, you do realize in both that of those. Gen you do realize that those are not uh, descriptors of like a, any sort. They're not. They're not applying any sort of allocates or uh, moral judgments upon them. They're just uh, the terms that they use to. The, I, the, I know that. That's my point. Is that Strauss' how generational theory is trying to make a. Uh, an, an objective scientific judgment about the quality of life broadly for that period of time, hence the reason it's called the theory. My response would be that uh, you shouldn't really take the take the calling of the, of the uh, millennial generation, the GI generation, the Republican generation, or any of these others as hero generations to be any sort of moral judgment, but really just sort of how they'll be viewed come later the GI generation nowadays you would see as well they're known as the greatest generation ever I'm pretty sure you would go to say uh, the 1790s or the 1800s that the veterans of the Revolutionary War would have been seen as just like the greatest heroes this country has ever seen and I'm sure that the Germans would have said the same thing about their soldiers had they won the World War II seculum it's not a moral exactly. judgment it's just a it's just an observ. I think the hero moniker is just an observation about how popular culture is going I to know. see them. What I just said is that it's not a necessarily a moral judgment, but it's not objective either. You, and you just uh, you did that point for me. Yeah, pretty much. That, there's no. I don't think there's any disagreement here. Powers had won World War Two then the silent generation would have still been if the theory had even been developed they would have still been seen as an archetype generation archetype i don't think that's a term they use you mean artist artist okay i, I heard somewhere i think uh was, i was reading off a different site probably than you where did the archetype come from i mean all these generations are referred to as generational archetypes so, mm, I don't know. Did your avatar come from? <laughs> Mine? Another Spurg moment. I have one of those, like, every stream. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, you... Like, I can probably go over a story. I mean, there's details I'm going to omit, but this character in particular goes back, like, over ten years. I've been drawing a uh, webcomic that none of you guys are ever going to see. Ever. And yeah, this is the main character. I know. F hey, Anons, you should uh, you should get on that. <laughs> they'll they'll probably find it after a few. Uh, they'll probably find it fairly quickly. I know for a fact that uh, one of my three readers uh, actually watches my videos. So hi. But yeah, this character goes back a while. And, and no one no one really cares. It just would be uh, interesting to see. I presume you don't want to uh, reveal it because it's got some fetish shit on it. Oh, hell no. <laughs> hell no. In fact, it's completely Bet tame. It's just autistic as hell. Also, let's just say that uh, my art has only barely improved in the last 10 years. Something I'm not entirely proud of. And even though in that one super... Um, that super autistic drawing you made of my character, you made him look like a rat. <laughs> I swear I traced him off of a I traced him off of the face of a fox. Looks like a rat. He's got those big long whiskers and he's got that round head. That that that's a rat. Uh, so are you are you done are we, are we done with the second point? I think we're done with the second point. Um point is that being that this is a scientific theory that proposes that you can predict a future pattern based off of the past, qualify Strauss Howe generational theory as historicism. So I'm not saying it's a Marxist doctrine, but uh, 
the Marxian dialectic would be an example of a historic, uh, historicist doctrine, the idea that utilizing the Hegelian dialectic to try and um, predict an outcome for society based on historical patterns. Um, I expressed my disagreements with historicism. Yes, you have. Uh, okay, why, well, for the, sake of, for the sake of uh, viewers, uh, why don't you uh, repeat your? Why don't you uh, go over that real quick? Problems with historicism laid out by Karl Popper, known as the poverty of historicism, and instead of just explaining it myself, I, I, I am going to explain it myself. But you should read this book if you want it in greater detail, because this book just basically kills the idea that it is a legitimate science and. It lays out a few major points for how historicism can't be scientific. Uh, the first of which being that the description of an entire society, well, because the list of characteristics making up such a description are com unlimited. There's, there are a bunch of variables you will not be able to account for, and therefore trying to make a scientific hypothesis of the direction society will go is a... Uh, be done in good faith. Being that human history is a single unique event which doesn't necessarily imply anything and otherwise is just the logical fallacy of induction, trying to uh, insert things that aren't really there given the related base material, uh, piece of material. The third being that uh, individual human action or reaction can never be predicted and therefore neither can the future, and I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Of course. Uh, the fourth being that for a law, a scientific or social exclude possibilities, but it does not allow us to narrow down a range of possible outcomes. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory, too. Yeah, I think so. Is that it's logically impossible to know the future course of history when it depends in part on knowing the future growth of scientific knowledge, which unless you are a mind reader or you can see the future, it wouldn't be possible to know that. What's going to come out or what we already have that's in development or how people are going to invest their money. It's just, it's a ridiculous uh, thing to try and predict that. Those are the main points based on which historicism can't possibly be scientific. and. Since Strauss-Howe generational theory is a historicist, historicist doctrine, what what are your thoughts on that? Uh, my thoughts, I'm worried, are going to come down to special pleading. But my immediate response is that it's going to uh, it can't predict the future. I mean, Strauss and Howe like stress very clearly in their book, uh, the fourth turning in American prophecy and yes you probably should check it out that obviously you can't possibly predict the future the book was written in 1995 so they couldn't imagine things like 9-11 uh, or the 2008 financial crash but maybe they knew about 9-11 in advance <laughs> if they knew about 9-11 that actually would be remarkable they predicted that there would be an event roughly around 2005 which is why on wikipedia you can probably see like a uh, fourth turning uh current from 2005 to present even though actually it would have started in 2008 with the financial crash interesting that they were that close i mean you you could be farther off but but yeah. still all they were doing is theory just making a broad claim saying oh well three years is close that wasn't that's not very specific though if you really think about it something that'll happen around 2005 it seems very vague that's true not gonna deny and, and that and you just explained how you could interpret that as being well 911 happened or you could interpret that as being the uh, 2008 market crash both of them are generally around 2005 mm -hmm. and they impacted the world greatly i think a, i think one difference is like how the world might have reacted to 911 is a lot more interesting than 911 itself like one one of the claims that they I, I do make that. What? I, I get that. So just to, just for the viewer's sake, I'm going to explain this. So one th aspect of the theory is that how uh, time periods react to certain events in history 
is going to change depending on the turning. Like on the first turning, if 9-11 happened, it would have been a call for uh, people to come together as a nation or as a society. If it happened during a third turning, it would just be a uh, another example of society falling apart, which is kind of what happened. I mean, yeah, you had some unity after 9-11, after but that quickly fell apart as the war in Iraq kind of fell into full swing. And in a, in a fourth turning, if 9-11 happened, society would have mobilized to just go absolute, hey, go, go nuclear on Iraq and Afghanistan. What about the Hindenburg disaster? That happened during the silent generation, which was a fourth turning, and no one reacted even remotely close to let's, let's go to war or whatever. I think that was because that was an accident and not really a, a cause for anything. I mean, what would it have catalyzed that we shouldn't use or we shouldn't be flying a giant balloon full of helium or hydrogen? Go to war with the sky. <laughs> well, I think only I think even the state is not is not dumb enough to do that. But then again, you did have a uh, Emperor Caligula who went to war no. with the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, don't ever underestimate the stupidity of the state. <laughs> I could I could very easily see. Um, like if this theory was correct that uh, in response to the Hindenburg disaster the state could say we're declaring war on helium <laughs> hydrogen <laughs> you know they probably helium, would they both start with an H and we're the state so they're the same <laughs> thing to us oh I would certainly hope not <laughs> I'm pretty sure you have to have a special kind of state, like the the Emperor Caligula's are kind of a, a special events in history, like a catalyzing events onto themselves. FDR was in office. Well, I mean, I, I could I could have seen that happening. True, but uh, unfortunately, he was a regeneracy event during a fourth turning. So, yeah, make of that what you will. And we kind of went off topic, like severely, but that's fine. I mean, my my third point, which is my biggest disagreement with Strauss Howe, is pretty straightforward. It's a historicist scientific theory, and you can't... And historicism is an inherently invalid doctrine. I'm just not... I'm just not 100% sure if uh, you could really say the same, because you have other historicist doctrines like Hegelian dialectics and, more importantly, Karl Marx's uh, uh, historical materialism. Which argued that like they knew exactly what was going to happen to society. This was going to happen. And yeah, this and was going to happen very specifically. Out. What? Um, and they don't happen. So what? So instead, they just um, they get like-minded people to infiltrate the government and then make those things happen. Like how he described the profit things becoming. Uh, the market innovating and making things cheaper but the prices still stayed high that that that's what Marx predicted and but that wouldn't happen if you didn't have all these minimum wage increases Marxist politicians advocate for and it's funny because in the German ideology Marx very specifically argued against uh, social democratic reforms on that specific grounds that uh, you can't reform a capitalist system that'll just make it worse yeah can't say he's wrong his conclusion was different but uh, his premise and his argument was almost spot on he almost got something right for once well all you have to do is just say democracy doesn't work and you you can't you can't fail it's like trying to shoot a barn while inside it so to answer your question I think uh, the big problem with historicism is that uh, it makes very specific specific predictions on how society would go, whereas the Strauss Howe generational theory is, and perhaps this is special pleading, I fully admit to this, but it's a lot more vague. They can't predict what's going to happen. They argue. They actually argue in their book that it's not possible to predict the future unless you have uh, magical powers that can't possibly exist in a rational universe. That we can't. That we can't say like what events are going to happen, who's going to respond to where, how generational archetypes uh, will operate very specifically. And obviously, these so, things are extremely important. But you can at least predict the patterns 
that people are going to follow. Really just an unfalsifiable theory, then. It probably is, yes. It's so... Actually, actually no, 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 that's not quite true, because in order, for, because there is a certain levels of falsifiability, mainly if you have, for example... Uh, that's that's fair. It sort of um, their predictions fall into a very specific category. Like you can't just point to anything and claim that uh, that would conform to their predictions. But you 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 yourself just touched upon it. That um, it they're left almost intentionally vague to where percent of things that happen at any given time could conform to the theory is there there are things that happen all the time in different areas of society and the world that could conform to any generation during any period of time mm-hmm. you know a lot of things that would uh, represent a fourth turning if we're going to look at like the music and the arts if i mean it doesn't really specify what makes a generation only that I didn't catch that. What makes a generation what? Generation any certain way, and that's sort of what makes it so. It it gives it a hyperinflated uh, explanatory power. I, I suppose that would be a more thing. It's not unfalsifiable. It just has more explanatory power than what is rational for what the theory is pre- presenting. I see. So. It, you think it has too much explanatory power? Uh, it, it's funny because Popper himself also touched upon that, that uh, theories which have more explanatory power than what they're rationally capable of are generally theories, or there's something wrong with them. What he said is that they're unfalsifiable, but we've already established that this isn't necessarily an unfalsifiable hypothesis. And But, but the same rule applies here, that there's... Um, it's left intentionally vague so that there's more explanatory power than what's actually presented. I should point out that, at least on the topic of falsifiability, because for a moment I did agree with you, but then it occurred to me, like, no, this is absolutely falsifiable. Say, for example, in 2030 to 2050, which is when the next first turning is predicted, that we go right back to essentially the 90s, a time when uh, with low institutional trust but high individual enjoyment. And there's like cynicism in the air, distrust. Uh, people fall back into their own yeah, but that's you. groups and takes on but the characteristics that's you. of a third turning. Assuming that um, we're talking about one specific area, which is what I was talking about, if you. Um, the the Strauss Howe generational theory doesn't explicitly reference that. Uh, it could be uh, that it's a political movement. In fact, it's very specifically, it says it's for the broad area of society. So, I mean, you could have political sense, but you could also have that in an artistic sense, and it could conform to being a fourth turning as well. Well, art, art, or art and taste tends to also follow the turnings. I mean, not specifically, but I mean, like, what movies would be enjoyed during certain turnings might not be able to be even be made. Like I touched on this in my uh example made... of that and a great example of that is that uh through which, which one I touched enlightenment the... the enlightenment generation. That's not talking about a political movement. That's merely talking about social attitudes and the arts. But that's a fourth turning. We have fourth turnings that society is just completely going to shit. Attitudes are terrible. Uh, everybody hates one another. Pulp development is just... its I, I only caught every other word. No, no, it's, sub, sub, it's subjectively interpreted to be thing uh, and th- uh, that's because I'm stammering I'm sort of ha- starting to have mental exhaustion here oh uh, I'm just uh I'm starting to think faster than I'm talking and that's what happens whenever that whenever that happens I start stammering a lot yeah I was wondering if that was discord because it sounded like you were being cut off every other word in the recording too maybe I don't know my computer's pretty uh, beefy I think it can handle it so could you did uh... you have anything could you uh, okay. sum up what you said? Bef- 
just before because I only caught most of it. About uh, Strauss' how generational theory is a- another point, I suppose. Something a turning seems to also itself be subjective. It could be a political movement. It could be the changings of social attitudes. While politi- while politics suck, you could have desirable political developments according to your own subjective opinion. While uh, social attitudes suck, and there's nothing really going on with art. Well, I did give the. Uh... I was going to go into uh, my May 4th video on Star Wars and the Turnings, and that actually provides a pretty good example. Uh, Strauss and Howe actually used the example of Star Wars uh, A New Hope, Episode 4, aka the original Star Wars, as an example of a movie that just makes absolutes, is like the kind of movie that uh, would really appeal to a certain generation. You couldn't make uh, A New Hope today because the themes of mysticism triumphing over technology simply would would it makes perfect sense to a uh, a more mystic a less rational second turning but to a fourth turning audience it's it's not going to go over all too well which is exactly what happened with the force awakens tried to make another new hope and that's what happened yep well the problem the problem with uh the force awakens wasn't necessarily its message, it's that they did it in the worst possible way. A New Hope, there was, wasn't even really, like, he wasn't really getting into his Jedi abilities at that time. They didn't get into Luke being a Jedi until uh, the Empire Strikes Back, but in The Force Awakens, character Rey has no training, and she's more powerful than... A freaking trained Jedi and... A freaking trained Jedi and dark side user, because she just closes her eyes. Nessus, I mean, a lot of people uh, think that's the problem. I've seen that. You're not the first person to point that out to me, but think that that could have worked, except they just told, they just made the ki- the sto- the movie about a Mary Sue, and that's why it didn't really work as well as it did. And don't tell me that Ray is not a Mary Sue. Ray is a Mary Sue. I think by any objective standard of measurement, she's a Mary Sue. Let's see, uh, she has uh, this amazing power with uh, no explanation or training. She just has it. The entire universe basically revolves around her. Like, you remember, what was it called, uh, The Last Jedi? How basically the entire movie, or no, first half of the movie was like Snoke trying to just like, bring me, bring Rey to me, bring Rey to me, she's so important. <laughs> It's like a uh, fan fiction. The only way that Rey could be any more of a Mary Sue is if she had uh, rainbow-colored Pegasus wings. I'm pretty sure you've already inspired some deviant art uh, entries right there. That from a, a Mary Sue meme, the Mary Sue had rainbow Pegasus wings, and it's completely freaking true because there are so many uh, Mary Sue characters that have something like that. Oh, and by the way, in uh, episode 9, she's, or not her, but uh, Leia is supposed to have, like, insanely over-the-top force powers. It's it's bad enough that she can basically fly through space, Mary Poppins style, but now she's apparently uh, tearing down battleships from orbit. Is so insane. Did Luke even have that sort of power in the expanded universe? Uh, Actually, yes. Uh... The well, thing is, though, he became the uh, most powerful Jedi ever in the expanded universe, like ever. But it, it kind of makes sense because one, we saw him like gain his power through the movies and raise a family, all sorts of really cool stuff. Like, I'm not too familiar with the expanded universe; is just all I know. But yeah, that was a thing. So, do you have well, any more about oh, Strauss? How gen- what? I'm gonna have to oh, okay. edit that down if I can find it. Any more about Strauss how generational theory? Uh, yeah, I think the best I can say is that yeah, you... the best you can say about it is that it is very vague, and thus it does provide perhaps too much explanatory power that does make a lot of sense, and it's also, uh... however, it does also have a very, I think, satisfactory set of possibilities that its vagueness also works in its favor that. If uh, a new generation, or if, if yeah, if the new post Gen Z generation takes on characteristics of a, a cynical nomad generation, 
or a very quiet and supportive artist generation, then you can probably disprove uh, the Strauss Howe generational theory pretty easily. You can also probably just do that by having society take on, make a deliberate effort to make sure that the generation after Gen Z is, you know, raised differently than the way baby boomers were. Well, I mean, you can disprove it. You can point at the silent generation. Look how horrible that was. Uh, how are they horrible? You basically had a worldwide market decline. You had millions. I, I got into how it's horrible art. But, the, but there were least... kids at the time. Right, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. it's not their fault. I mean, you you could probably blame... Uh, it's I would not... Say the, I would say it's the missionary generation's fault. The GI generation came before... Yeah, but they would have been generation. young adults. They would have been either children or young adults at the time. Let's... let's let me look at my notes real quick. Um, no, uh, the GI generation was 1901 to 1924, so during World War II, they would have been these or their uh, early 30s. They would have been the 30s. The youngest of their cohorts starting around uh, World War II would have been uh, 24. Yeah, they would have been like just barely old enough to sign up. They would have been... Uh... I think the appropriate age for signing up. You probably had some uh, silent mixed in there, though they were probably like too young. But for sure, the ones signing up were or being drafted were bulk GI. I don't think that they were. They were definitely not the cause of the Great Depression, though. They would have just been too young. They were kids at the time. Yeah, I, I know. I'm just saying what's going on in society. You have a. You have the Great Depression. You have these tens, hundreds of millions of people dying, you have these unjust you, well, all wars are unjustifiable, but you have these wars that are blatantly done in the name of power. Mm -hmm. What happens in the end is you get the baby boomers and uh, you get these organizations installed which turn out to even at the time were pretty a tyrannical like the UN or the EU. So my point is that you know, you know what who, about the silent generation makes it a artist generation? Uh, the fact that uh, let's see, you had Jimi Hendrix, you had uh, the Beatles, you had uh, what's his name, Elvis Presley. Yeah, even Martin Luther King Jr. They were all about the uh, the people who resonated with the culture during the. Uh, First that's and what I'm talking about. Turning of the next of the uh, next seculum, and that's what I'm talking about about the cherry picking assholes who came out of there too. Of course, there's going to be assholes in every generation. Well, except the the asshole concentration is particularly high in the prophet generation. I'm pretty sure like the problems we have the baby boomers today would have been the same thing for the missionary generation. Which, by the way, guess who are in their middle age and elderhood come the. Uh, third turning and fourth turning of the great power seculum, the missionary generation, who are the same generational archetype as the baby boomers. Gee, I wonder if that's a coincidence. Probably not. No, of course not. It's the same it's the same crap throughout history. I guarantee you that the transcendental generation were absolute assholes in their time, as were the Awakening, Puritan. Well, I mean, it's Puritan, so you can probably guess how terrible they were. Uh, Reformation and whoever it was that came before uh, the Arthurian generation in uh, the late medieval seculum. But that's my point, though, is that it's just sort of picking and choosing parts that conforms and doesn't. There, there are artists that come out of every generation. There are mm -hmm. uh, assholes that come out of every generation, and there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're not uh, discounting the individuality of every member of their generation. It's just that you're more. This is that they're more like. Pr more likely to be predisposed to certain actions and behaviors. I mean, then again, like, have you ever met a baby boomer who was not a narcissist? Time pointing one out, but at the same time, we, uh, the third turning, um, the millennials, there's a lot of single mothers and there's just a lot of rates that, uh, are not good. We're basically raising a generation of, uh, people who are just going to be like Ramsey from Game of Thrones. I... I'm sorry, I don't watch Game of Thrones, so the reference is lost on me.
He is a self-centered psychopath who just does whatever he wants to anybody. He's like the only cool character on the show and they killed him off so I'm not interested anymore because they've just all that's left is that overpowered dragon bitch and it's just not interesting to watch now. Yeah, that's uh that sounds like a kind of a problem. Although you know what, I I don't remember the exact details off the top of my head, but I remember Strauss and Howe actually giving examples of the very similar things were said about the GI generation during their time. That we were just raising a, a generation of entitled uh, entitled psychopaths. Say the same thing about every generation. That's my point, is that noth nothing here is specific to any generation. Uh, they, they do give examples of certain traits and characteristics played upon generation. Like, if you recall, Gen X was not meant to be, like, extreme. It was meant to be a pejorative, a generation of losers, a generation of nobodies, and that's conforming to the nomad archetype, that as a generation, yeah. they're put down. They, they can't live up to the... The whole thing's like, they can't live up to the glorious legacy of the hero, the hero generation, who are just now entering elderhood at the time, and they're not as special or important as the prophets, who are now entering young adulthood. They're kind of just there. Understood. Uh, I I understand what Gen X is like. What what it meant. I'd I'd actually to recall if I've ever heard anyone call it Generation Extreme, and if they did, I would think they were stupid. They're probably stupid, but uh, if you recall, like in the '80s and late '90s, there was a a lot of branding around X. Like the X. You remember the the X foot the XFL the Extreme Football League. I don't know why I recall that one off the top of my head, but just in um, I, I I for some some reason I like going on YouTube occasionally and I watch commercial breaks from years ago people recorded, and just watch '90s commercials. Just you don't even need to see the brand, just the attitude and everything. <laughs> very, it has a very specific um, uh, tone to everything. It's like. Everything is talking really fast and yelling, and they love they love the close up camera, the wide angle lens. They love it. Don't they also love the Dutch angles? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a that's always a fun thing. And occasionally you'll get a. Uh... It's it's more the wide angle lens. I like just try that. Go look up like a commercial break from 1996 or something, and. Like, I swear to God, if it's not every commercial, then, like, every third commercial mm -hmm. will um, feature a wide-angle lens. I'm, I couldn't say if that's a, a characteristic of a thir third turning. Probably not. It's probably just the style at the time. Well, that's... And that's what I mean. I mean, that wasn't just an off offhand thing. I actually had a point with that. It's that uh, these are stylistic things mm -hmm. as well. There's more... I, I think it's more of a influence than it is oh, it's just, it's this generation, so we gotta do this. Yeah, that seems about right. Uh, if I recall correctly, like, there was a one example that they provided was that during the 50s and 60s, or very early 60s, that like, it was, it was found that the baby boomers were the first uh, generation of kids ever who were a specific childhood marketing demographic. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I didn't know that. Yeah, it was the first time ever that there was just a... Yeah, that was a thing, apparently. Which kind of goes on to the point that they're trying to make about the generational archetypes that a prophet generation who are born after a crisis are going to be indulged as hell. And as a result, well, you end up with a bunch of raging narcissists as adults. Yeah, well, that's, um, it seems that's more of a, uh, prophecy than it is sort of a, uh, well, it's this generation, so it's gotta be, it's gonna happen this certain way, it's, well, is, uh, indulgent then, if there is a lot of indulgence and there is a lot of austerity, then, uh, stands to reason that, but the there's austerity there's a lot of people getting rich all the time and that's another that's another um another problem with that is again that just goes there's to any generation every generation is well they're going to have problems
but it's always specific problems, it seems. The way you put, put it, like, these problems are more common. Again, that assumes a sort of, uh, as, assumes a political opinion. Uh, I don't think so. I'd like to know what uh, political view uh, is being assumed. I mean, there is kind of a theory that, uh, Joking right now, I I actually like I forgot what I said. <laughs> you said that uh, it's ascribing certain political beliefs, and it they actually do make that argument I, that I certain generations. Right there. I, fucking, I don't even remember what just happened. Okay. Uh, yeah, everything okay? Everything's fine. Okay, good. Yeah, so he does point out that. Uh, Certain generations are going to be more predisposed to, say, liberal or conservative ideas. Generally speaking, smaller government or bigger, or smaller government more collectivist, or smaller government more individual, bigger government more collectivist. Is that what ideas. I said? That uh, people are going to develop political opinions, and that uh, that that assumes a political opinion. What the fuck? <laughs> oh my god! You said something about that, yeah. You can you'll be able to hear it in the recording if you listen back. Uh, I'll I'll listen back. Um, I'd prefer uh, not to reveal a lot about uh, how my mind works on camera because that's uh, that's the one thing that I did in ski that's valuable information. It's uh, I it's important that uh, I know what I know, but you know something different. That helps me for debates. That helps me for just about everything. All right about it because it doesn't seem like we're really going anywhere no not really I think that's just about it I mean that was that was good yeah it was interesting yeah I mean, we explored some of these ideas at least uh, just out of curiosity have you have you uh, read the book which book uh, the Strauss Howe one yes when we officially established that there was going to be a debate today I picked it up and I read like 30 pages in but I haven't been able to oh, read, yeah, the, read whole the whole thing, thing. I it it goes a uh, a bit deeper uh, the further further in you go. I'll make sure to do that. And anyone who's interested in a specific critique of historicism, you should pick up Historicism by Karl Popper. Then more people need to read because it it's not just uh, Strauss Howe or Karl Marx. There's just there's a there's idea that's prevalent in society you can predict the future by looking at the past i suppose if we're going to talk about specific things like oh well we got to have we're going to have a uh, we're going to have a lot of money and a lot of resources so that's going to lead to something uh that's that's fine but uh individual development is different mm -hmm. predict everything just based on that you can predict very specific things, but that's not predicting the future. That's just taking something you already know and making a uh, generalization. 